Considering how my bedroom used to be, this is an improvement. It's true, Roger. But true. we're streaming live now. <laughs> and there he goes. All right. It's not that we don't want you to see Roger. He just don't, doesn't want you to be distracted by him. All you'll do is look at Roger all show. All right, here we go. This podcast is made possible by listeners like you at patreon.com slash ace detect. Offer void where prohibited. Your mileage may vary. Product may contain nuts. This is the Daily Tech News for Tuesday, July 14th, 2015. I'm Tom Merritt. Joining me today, as she does most Mondays, even though today's Tuesday, Veronica Belmont. How's it going? You totally ruined my happy Monday joke. Oh, you can still do it. Happy Monday, everyone. Let's just let's just pretend it's Monday. We, we're just going to pretend it's Monday from now on. Uh, also joining us today on this Monday, Jessica Condit, senior reporter at Engadget. How's it going, Jess? Hey, good to be here, guys. Thank you for joining us. We've got, uh, we got some interesting uh, stories to talk about to bring you your mood back up from yesterday's show, uh, a little forward in the show. But uh, let's start. Veronica, with, would you like to do some headlines? I would like to do some headlines. All right. Beacons are one-way transmissions that give you information for what you're near. Uh, bus stops, uh, shopping discounts, things like that. You hear about iBeacon all the time. That may be the most familiar one. Google is launching something called Eddystone. It's an open-source cross-platform Bluetooth LE beacon. Uh, that's low energy. Eddystone is cross-platform for Android and iOS and open-source under the Apache version 2.0 license, though Google will do its little Android thing where they'll have an open-source platform but then offer their own proprietary uh, products, a nearby API and a proximity beacon cloud service. Unlike most beacon implementations, Eddystone will support multiple what they call frame types. So, the, for instance, the iBeacon from Apple has a universally unique identifier, a UUID. Eddystone will have that, but it will also have good old-fashioned URL support, uh, ephemeral identifiers for security, and something called telemetry, which will allow you to do some diagnostics. I'm not familiar with the term ephemeral identifier. Yeah, I uh, don't think I've seen this before either, but I guess the idea is that it will only go to you if you're authorized. So you're, you, you only get the transmission, you only receive the transmission if you're authorized to receive it. I, they use the example of like keys, for instance, mm. lost keys or a lost phone. You wouldn't know it, about lost phone. No, I wouldn't know anything about a lost phone. Dang it. Um, so is this, a, is, is this a walking advertising platform essentially, or not a platform, but a, a, an easy way to, to deliver ads to us on the go? Yeah, it's, it, c it can be, right? Like, that's, that's where all the money is. So that's probably what it's going to be used for most of it. But I think what they're trying to do with Eddie Stone is saying, hey, let's open source this so people can come up with all kinds of different ways to use it. And I, I like the public transportation uh, example. One of, one of the things they showed was that right now with GPS, they can't tell which side of the street you're standing on. So they could tell you buses are coming north or south. But with something like Eddie Stone, they would be able, because you're in, in proximity to the beacon itself, they'd be able to say, oh, you're standing by the northbound bus stop. We'll only send you the northbound times. I wonder if this will be better uh, than something like geofencing because I feel like geofencing, you know, I, I, I realize that there are separate technologies and they do different kinds of things, but in a way they're kind of giving you the same outcome in, in some ways um, in terms of location-based information, uh, but at the same time, you know, GPS and geofencing is so power inten in intensive. It takes yeah. so much power on your phone to actually have that running on in an ongoing way and, and being able to make the most of it, it just drains your, your battery. But I'm wondering what the power situation, I mean, if it's, if it's Bluetooth. Low energy, that's, that's, LE. That's pretty, yeah, low energy. I mean, that's, that's a good sign. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, right. It's my turn to read now. <laughs> Nokia is getting to be like that friend who said it really is going to finally start that project they've been talking about. You just wish they'd stop talking about it and get on with it. Reuters reports that Nokia confirmed Monday that it may start designing and licensing mobile phone handsets under its brand name in 2016. It just needs a partner to take on, you know, the little things like manufacturing, sales, marketing, and customer support. The company stated that a Nokia-branded phone would not arrive before the fourth quarter of 2016 when its deal with Microsoft allowed Nokia to sell phones under its name again. It's like, it's a, so on again. Like, 
they, they leak out something and they say, well, we can't really confirm that. And then the next day they confirm it. And then they confirm it again later. Uh, we get it. Nokia is going to come out with phones. Somebody else is going to build them. That all makes sense. Question is, by the time they can put these out, will the ship have sailed on Nokia phones? Or are there, you know, and, and we know smartphones in particular are maturing as a market. Uh, will they be able to trade on that name? Will they be able to make inroads in new markets? Maybe in some kind of like, oh, they're old school. Oh, it's retro. <laughs> Jessica, would you buy a retro Nokia phone? Well, I was looking at some like mock-ups of what they could look like. And yeah, these like bright neon with huge chunky cases and big old buttons. Uh, I think they would do well in Japan. So I feel like they still use those like flip phones and they use those kind of old school. They love that. I don't know. I don't know why, but it just is a thing. So so maybe that's where Nokia should should head. Just go to Japan. Yeah, go to Japan for the style, maybe Africa, Southeast Asia, India for the for the entry level stuff. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I would like to have a, a candy bar smartphone. If anybody can make it work, maybe Nokia. Can. Would you? Would you really? No, not really. I do have I do have fond memories of my old candy bar phone. I just don't think it's possible. Okay. Search Engine Land reports Google is preparing to reopen MapMaker, uh, the one that had all kinds of problems with people contributing updates that either weren't true or possibly offensive. Uh, they've got a new moderation procedure that will rely more on community moderators, meaning updates could take a little longer to be added, but they would have to be reviewed by the community. And the company said the tool will reopen in phases beginning early next month. Google will hire qualified regional lead candidates. Now, they throw around the word hire. I don't know if that means they're paid or volunteers, uh, but they will, they will vet them, uh, regional lead candidates to moderate, and some edits will still require Google approval. All right. Uh, yeah, that's, um, that's good. I mean, nothing ever bad came of community moderation, so I really... <laughs> Just ask Reddit. <laughs> What's the worst that could happen there? Anyway, moving on. Uh, and Gadget passes along that sources tell the information that Facebook is developing its own virtual assistant called MoneyPenny. Uh, MoneyPenny would live inside the Facebook Messenger app, and the sources say it would actually have real people answering your questions. So kind of like Amazon's Mayday button meets Siri. Yeah, that's clever. Uh, I, you know, it remains to be seen if this project is real or even if it is real, if it ever comes to market. But that would be a smarter way to do things, don't you think? If you kind of take, there's that startup magic that does this too, where you, where you mm -hmm. can text questions magic and they have real people. Yeah. So uh, that could be a way Facebook provides something that's a little different than just, oh, here's another virtual assistant. How about stop making me use Facebook Messenger? That'd be great. <laughs> can they do that? <laughs> well, you don't that? have to use it. <laughs> Messenger. If you want to live in this century, you do though. It's a, it's a shame. Yeah. It Ooh. is. It, it is sad. Um, you're right. I find myself using Facebook more and more, even though I don't really care to. I've, I'm not against it or anything. I just, um, I don't know. I find it befuddling the way it's organized. Mm -hmm. What part? Reports Wait, Wait I don't want to go back to that. What exactly <laughs> oh. do you find befuddling? I'm curious. It, you know what it is. It's that I haven't used it enough to know where everything is. And it's definitely not the kind of site where you can just look at it and say, oh, okay, there's, there's, there's the new things and there's where I message people. Like, there's the news feed, but then there's the other profile feed and then finding the things that you posted and the reactions to them are all at different places. It's, it's just I haven't hit the learning curve, that's all. Okay. It's better on mobile, though, it, like their mobile site. And that's because a lot of sites optimize for mobile now because yeah. that's where the market is. Yeah, for that sure. makes sense. CNET reports that Apple Pay has launched in the United Kingdom, but not all the banks announced as partners made it to the initial launch, but they'll get there. HSBC and First Direct said they will join later this month, and Lloyd's, Halifax, and Bank of Scotland will supposedly be supported in the autumn. Uh, there's also some of the cards putting uh, purchase amount limits on there, uh, of in some cases as low as 25 pounds. Uh, but hey, Apple Pay in the UK, the London way. Ooh, that's a title. <laughs> that's a title that has nothing to do with the rest of the show that we're talking about. Um, I am happy to report that I'm finally able to use Apple Pay on my watch as advertised. So, yay, a new feature on my watch. I'm so excited. 
All right, uh, Recode reports Comcast is starting a streaming game service in partnership with Electronic Arts. In the initial test period, a random group of Comcast subscribers who have X1 set-top boxes will be able to play for free. You can volunteer to be randomly selected at Xfinity.com slash Xfinity Games. The service will use a smartphone or tablet as a controller and focus on casual games like Plants vs. Zombies and FIFA 13. Data, will be, uh, data used will count against any data caps that you may have as well. So no um, net neutrality controversy here. Yeah, I, I mean, clearly I haven't tried this yet. Also, I don't have Comcast, but has anyone, has anyone seen this yet? No, who wants to, though, is the thing. <laughs> That's my well, question. Yeah, it does start to feel like uh, a little bit like the video games in the, in the seat backs on airplanes. Yeah. Where you're like, oh, video games, and then you look at them, and then you try to play them, <laughs> and then you're like, forget it. That's not, I mean, maybe it'll be much better than that. The X1 set-top boxes, by all accounts, are actually very good. So, you know, it's not like they're underpowered. So I, I wouldn't expect them to play badly, but it's casual titles, older titles. You have to use your phone well, that's the, the thing. Control. I mean, the funny thing is about, you know, the whole problem with mobile gaming is that the hardest part about mobile gaming is having to use the touchscreen as a viable controller. So being like, this is a feature. You have to use your mobile device, your tablet, to control these games. It's like, oh, like I'd rather maybe rent a controller for, from you for like $20 a month if it's going to come to that. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, I don't see this as being particularly, it, it sounds like a, like a, just an ad, like a, they, wrote it in somewhere and let's do this this will be fun why why are you doing that nobody wants that it. everyone has xboxes now who cares why would you do this i don't know unless it was is it going to be it is going to be free so that's good i mean at least they're giving at first during the trial you something anyway. for free yeah for now mm -hmm. probably not forever i mean jessica then, do you have an idea of who who would this who this would be for? Because obviously Comcast trying to test something that makes it not be just an ISP, right? That they can eventually charge for. Right, and this is, I mean, it has to be for people who have Comcast, who have the X One, and then don't have an Xbox One or a or a PS Four or a, a Wii or a Wii U. Even uh, not that many people have a Wii U anymore. But yeah, it's it's got to be for these people who don't have consoles, but are kind of getting into this new gaming thing. And I really don't think that playing video games on a tablet or a smartphone as the controller, that's not the way to introduce people to games, even casual ones, because uh, it's just not a, a very good experience. So I don't know. I wonder about this one, but hey, maybe maybe this is a good idea. I guess we'll see. Everyone has a smartphone, so could yeah. work. I, yeah. I get the idea behind it, for sure. Uh, but like you say, like even Plants vs. Zombies has a timed element to it. And when you're mm -hmm. dealing with smartphone controls that are disconnected from the screen you're looking at, right? Because you have it's to look scary. up. Yeah, yeah, it just yeah. Yeah, doesn't really work. <laughs> They're making fun of me in the chat room because I said $20 a month for a controller. Yes, I, that was just a stupid example. I don't really mean you should pay. They should charge $20 a month for the controller. I'm just saying, whatever. If it was part of your package when you bought your darn set-top box, you'd be like, here, and then throw in this controller. Yeah. <laughs> that's well, I'm maybe at. that's what they'll find. When they do this, I it's, I think it's, it's Monday, a, guys. I'm really tired. Like I have <laughs> crashed myself from the weekend. You know, I'm still kind of on Sunday time. I'll get there. The Guardian found data hidden in the source code of Google's transparency report that reveals information about the people making right to be forgotten requests. Of the roughly 220,000 individual requests made to Google in this report, less than five percent concern criminals, politicians, or high-profile public figures, which are often used as examples of problems with right to be forgotten. The data covers about three-quarters of the requests made to date. Google has since updated the source code to remove that data. <laughs> Way to go. Well, because it doesn't help. Their, their case is like, hey, when we're removing these things, we're removing relevant data from, from these types of people. And if the requests are coming from private individuals most often, that kind of undermines that case. Mm-hmm. We get lots of great suggestions for stories at our subreddit, dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. Uh, thanks to the more than 5,000 people who are in there participating and, of course, our amazing mods. Uh, if you haven't stopped by, you ought to. It actually has a great fountain of tech news on its own, just if you want to see a great cross-section, and it helps us figure out what to put in the lineup. You've heard some things that were submitted there already. Star Fury Zeta sent us the Gizmodo report that Mozilla blocked 
all versions of Flash starting Monday night as a result of multiple zero-day vulnerabilities. And then, of course, Adobe today released a new version of Flash that Firefox does not block. But pretty intense move there on Mozilla's part to be like, you know, we're just not going to deal with this anymore. This is unsafe. We're going to block mm -hmm. Flash till they fix it. Good for them. Yeah, I'm totally on board with that, actually. Mm -hmm. Maybe that'll get more people using Mozilla. Maybe it will. Uh, Drew CPU sent us the news that Reddit's chief engineer, Bethane Blount, uh, sorry if I'm saying her name incorrectly. Bethany Blunt? It Bethany. would have been my guess. Bethany. That's better. Bethany Blunt uh, confirmed that she has left the company because she didn't think she could deliver on promises being made to the community. She said, quote, there are some very aggressive implied promises being made to the community in comments to mods, quotes from board members, and they're going to have some pretty big challenges in meeting those implied promises. Uh, Blunt has been with Reddit for less than two months. Um, she came over from... Facebook? Yes. I believe, yeah. She came over from Facebook. Um, I, I think she's going to leave to do her own startup now. Yeah, it was what I believe I read from, from Recode. Um, but this is, you know, this is, people are, are jumping ship at this point now, I think, because it, it's, it feels like a pretty aggressive environment over there right now. And there's, we're getting a lot of mixed messages from, from the board members and from Alexis, and, and it's, it's getting kind of intense. Mm -hmm. I read an interesting story on TechCrunch, or an inter interesting take on TechCrunch uh, today, and I wish I, I still had it open so I could credit the author, but they were basically saying, this is kind of normal for Reddit. Like, things just tend to happen, and then Reddit keeps chugging on. Uh, and, I, I, you know, the point was, at a certain point, too many of these types of things can undermine them, but they don't think that they've hit that point yet. Uh, and I... It does seem like, you know, if you look at the Reddit front page, it looks just as weird as it does any other day. So it's it's situation normal there. Mm -hmm. uh, and subreddits are, are active. I mean, they could still mess it up, but I, it's easy to overblow what's going on at Reddit because of these kinds of departures. But at the same time, someone leaving and then talking, I think, is the most significant part of this. She didn't just leave and say, no, 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 I've got nothing to say. You know, everything's fine. Everything's fine. I'm just going off to pursue my own That's projects, which is what people often say. You know, she's saying, uh, they told me to achieve something I didn't think I could do. So I left. And that's a similar message we've heard from a few other employees or former employees speaking out and saying, actually, there's some some shady things going on here. I didn't agree with some of the policies. And that is that is a little concerning because I don't think that happens every day. And it's not every day that, like, the moderators of the AMA forums get to write an editorial in the New York Times. Right. It, you know, like, that, so there is something, something happening. Uh, I don't think it's just, you know, standard business dealings right there. Yeah. I'm really curious to see what, what comes of all of this. Is Reddit just going to kind of return to its is the way things were before the shakeup started, or are there going to be major changes? I mean, they seem to say so, but I feel like the community just wants it to kind of go back to the way it was. So are they going to do what the community wants, or, or what's what's best for the board, or I don't know what's best. I mean, thank God. I'm glad I'm not on that board. <laughs> I get the feeling that... I'm glad I'm not at all involved in that company. <laughs> right. I do get the feeling that Alexis Ohanian has a vision, and if you don't fit with that vision, then you hit turbulent waters, whether it means you get removed or you just get frustrated and quit or you run into problems with the community and, and you know, you leave. Uh, I, I think for good or ill, there is a stabilizing, a stabilizing force there that's sort of behind a lot of the good and the bad that's going on there. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if I'd call it a stabilizing force, but okay. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a bad metaphor, but it's, it's, it's a consistent force. Maybe that's a better, okay. better word for it. <laughs> and that's a look at the headlines. All right. So yesterday uh, we had the very sad news of the death of Satoru Iwata of Nintendo. Uh, so today we wanted to take a little bit of a look forward. And thankfully, we already had Jessica Condit booked to come on the show. And you wrote uh, an article about Jade Raymond mm -hmm. starting uh, a new job uh, over at Electronic Arts along with Amy Hennig. Uh, to work on a Star Wars game. Those are all good news, and, and these are two bright spots in the game in the industry right now. Yeah, and this is like, oh, this is so exciting, honestly, for me, because these are two, two people who have been in the industry for a very long time, had their hands in, like, super uh, impressive and, you know, notable franchises in the industry. So Jade Raymond um, is, is now with EA. She was 
at Ubisoft, and she actually ran Ubisoft Toronto. She had a hand in producing um, the Assassin's Creed games, so you know she she helped with Watch Dogs. She knows her AAA. Uh, and then Amy Hennig, who is at EA, she's been there for a while. She is at Visceral, which is an EA studio. Uh, she's working on Star Wars right now. Now, she's the one who wrote, like, Naughty Dog's pivotal franchise, Uncharted. Uh, she was creative director. She, she wrote, like, all of the Uncharted games. Um, she even helped with the new one. Uh, and that one, that one isn't out yet. But she joined EA before that one came out, or before that one uh, was even, like, announced. So... This is cool. These two are going to be working together on EA's, I believe, third Star Wars game uh, in recent memory. Yeah, very exciting. I guess my my question about this is, you know, first of all, it's it's amazing news that these two women, like you said, are involved in this major major project for for EA. And you know, Star Wars games in the past have been kind of hit and miss, uh, where there's been some 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 good titles and some bad titles, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, but do you think this would have been as big of a story if it weren't Jade Raymond, if it were just another studio chief moving from from one studio to another? No, it, I mean, this is definitely a story about these two women, these two people. Um, and, yeah, it is notable that these are now two women in two very powerful positions at EA and in these, at, you know, in charge of this huge franchise, Star Wars. Like, this isn't the, the, the little leftover bits or anything. Um, so that is notable still in our industry to, to say that, yes, these two women are in charge, and that's cool. Um, and people are excited. So that's what really made me happy was that it wasn't, comments of, oh, it's going to explode, it's not going to it's not going to do well. It was a lot of people saying, awesome, I loved Assassin's Creed, I loved Uncharted, these two women are working together, these two people are working together. That's amazing. Um, so that really is cool, to, just to see the excitement, too, that a lot of people are feeling about this move. Um, and I think, so like, yeah, EA has Star Wars The Old Republic, which is that MMO they have, um, and uh, it, it has lost a lot of, of fan support over the years. It, it wasn't quite as, as uh, renowned as, as EA really wanted it to be. It's um, a definition of hit or miss all in honestly, one, right? Because yeah. yeah. I played it when it launched, and there were some, some amazing things that they did with the lore and the way they gave you quests, but they were just not able to sustain it, I guess. That's absolutely what it seems like. People, you know, players started dropping off, and then it, it's kind of where it is now. It's still around, but hardly... Um, and then now we have Star Wars Battlefront as well, that's, and that's coming from EA's other studio, DICE. Uh, they do the Battlefield series. Uh, so Star Wars Battlefront actually looks really cool, I think. I played some local co-op of that at, uh, I believe, at E3 just a few months ago or a month ago. Uh, EA messes with my mind. I don't even know what year that was. <laughs> too um, many it's too, too many things. Yeah, so, so that, that looks really cool, and then this is going to be something probably more narrative-driven, uh, this new Star Wars game, if they have Amy Hennig uh, kind of running it, yeah. What is this going to mean for future Uncharted titles? That's what I want to know, because, I mean, Uncharted is probably one of my, as well, favorite series of all times. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, Amy has always been really the driving force behind that and the, the creative vision behind that series. Um, so what, what, do you, what, what have you been hearing about this? Are people nervous about the, the future of the franchise? Well, I mean... So I was at E3, and they, you know, they had the big, uh, at the end of Sony's uh, conference, they had this big Uncharted demo, and uh, it was very fun. A lot of people very excited. So, like, the excitement is there for Uncharted still. Um, it hasn't been proven that, you know, the writing is, is terrible or anything yet. <laughs> um, you know, yet. Hey, who knows? Yeah, who knows? So, yeah, the, like, the extended demo that Naughty Dog released... Um, it shows, you know, some pretty cool writing. It's very much an action game, and then there's some classic, like, Indiana Jones-style twists and, and funny lines and all that. Um, so there's still some pretty solid, uh, you know, game makers going into this. Um, I don't think the excitement has died down for that franchise yet, but I am glad that we are at the end of that series and that, like, that is, you know, Amy Hennig's kind of, you know, masterpiece, and she did see it all the way through. Uh, at least to the beginning of the development of this game, yeah. And it was I noticed in the uh, Wikipedia biography of Hennig uh, that there are a couple of citations of her talking about her belief in the creative direction holding more importance than the graphics of a game. And that totally just mirrored uh, many of the things that Satoru Iwata had said. And I think it shows that this is what makes for uh, a, a great 
designer of narrative is somebody who says, let's make the technology serve the storytelling. Mm -hmm. And I mean, Nintendo lived by that. Like they came out, the Wii U, you know, they came out and it was not this graphical powerhouse uh, that the Xbox One or the PS4 was. So yeah, and but they proved obviously that uh, you can have awesome, fun experiences if you have a solid story, if you have a solid character, if you have the mechanics down, the graphics don't actually mean as much. Uh, you know, like I, I never concern myself with you know 60 frames per second or anything like that. Um, I understand it definitely helps for like competitive shooters and all that. I get that, um, but I don't need it in my experiences. That's why I like a lot of the indie titles as well, because uh, they do have a focus on narrative and you know creating. Uh, dense worlds that you really feel like you can live in. Um, so I feel like with that kind of mindset, now EA also has Frostbite Engine graphical, like extreme powerhouse that they have. Um, so we have solid narrative, solid graphics, if the technology works, EA, we're watching you. Um, and so it should be okay, yeah. Yeah, it's the fact that this is Star Wars, you know, I, I think is fortuitous because it does look to me as if we are getting in the gaming industry the kinds of reputations around people that we've had in movies for a long time. Somebody who wrote a script in the 20s uh, was, was unique if anyone knew their name. Now we, we always talk about the screenwriter. You know, who wrote the script for that? Who directed that movie? So J.J. Abrams and Lawrence Kasdan working together on Star Wars The Force Awakens is important to us to know because we have faith in the past work of those people. And this feels like the new version of that. Jade Raymond, you know, she started as a programmer at Sony. She worked on Sims Online. She worked on Assassin's Creed. Uh, Amy Hennig started for Atari, uh, doing a game called Electro Cop, uh, designed Michael Jordan Chaos in the Windy City. So a long, a long resume of amazing things. And of course, Uncharted, uh, topping the list, you have a, a star writer and a star producer working together and on Star Wars. So it <laughs> seems like it would, it would be positive. I think so, yeah. And it's Although interesting. Yeah, go on. Oh, I was going to say, you know, I was reading some of the, the uh, comments on Engadget, and I think they really mirror a lot of the other sentiment around on the Internet. Um, is Jade Rabin still hot enough to work in games? I think this oh, is really the most important you question. You had to bring that up. <laughs> I think Amy Schumer can answer that, actually. Can we get her on the line? <laughs> yeah. I hate the Internet. <laughs> oh, some days, man. <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh, no wow. kidding. I, you know, I didn't realize they were women. Uh, I don't see gender. I'm told they're women and I believe it. Uh, so thank you for pointing that out. Uh, but yeah, check this out. Uh, you've got the story. Jessica's got the story up at Engadget.com. And of course, uh, Jessica does lots of great uh, coverage over at Engadget as well. Uh, and congratulations to Jade Raymond and Amy Hennig. I looked at both their Twitter feeds and they were just filled with responses from people who were seriously excited uh, about th this appointment. So that, it does warm your heart. Yeah, I do. I just love the the vibe around Star Wars right now. Like yeah. coming coming out of Comic Con and you know the excitement around the the films and the excitement around the game and the cast just being so thrilled about it. It's just it really feels like the the film we've been waiting for. I mean, you know, after the prequels and you know they they were. Okay. Yeah, there was mixed feelings about the prequels, but I think this fear. really feels like the next coming of Star Wars to me <laughs> in, yeah. in so many ways. And like a really fantastic, re not, not reboot, but like reinvigoration of, of, the, of, of the films. Of the franchise, yeah. Of the franchise, thank you. All right, let's get to our pick of the day. Nicholas needed to work on two different machines. I had to pull data from one to work on the other, and I know what you're saying, get a KVM. Well, Nicholas said, I don't want to clutter up my desk with a KVM. And then I know a bunch of you are saying, well, what about Synergy? And Nicholas said, nah, they dropped their free version, and I'm cheap. He didn't say he was cheap, actually, but he did say he always looks for free alternatives. So here's what he found. I stumbled upon Mouse Without Borders by Microsoft Garage. They set up, was a breeze, installed on both computers, sync via security codes, and voila, it's working. Most importantly, it's working great. You can set up to four computers, choose to lock the mouse to avoid accidental switching if you want. There's no master-slave relationship between the machines, meaning that you can use the input devices from any of the linked computers to control the others, and Synergy doesn't work that way. Uh, the share clipboard functionality does seem a little iffy, he said, and he couldn't get the share file functionality to work at all, so if those are important to you, you might need to keep looking for something else. Also, it's Windows only, so if you're a Mac person, it's not going to work for you there. Uh, but he said, overall, though, if you want to share a 
mouse and keyboard over different Windows machines, it's painless and completely free. Uh, we'll have a link to it in the show notes as well. But uh, thank you, Nicholas. Uh, as a reminder, these picks are not sponsored. These are just your picks for things you like to use. You can send your picks to feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com and find my picks at dailytechnewsshow.com slash picks. I, I'm so surprised that they think that a KVM takes up all that much room because it's for me, it's just one tiny button next to my laptop that I push back and forth. For I'm imagining Nicholas has like a back. white desktop with nothing on it. That sounds nice. Okay. Just good for clutter, him. Clutter free. All right. Yeah. I got a couple of emails before we get out of here. Chris in Toronto said, as you stated during yesterday's pick, power line networking can be hit or miss. I recently tried the same hardware mentioned, the TP-Link, 500 megabits per second power line kit, but found a glaring issue. Despite it, advertising speeds up to 500 megabits per second. The ports on the device are only 10100. I found that it was not fast enough to keep up with full 1080p. All of that said, these devices have dropped in price significantly over the years, and they seem to work well enough for lower bandwidth applications. I should mention that there are kits that supposedly support gigabit speeds, but they are more expensive. Uh, so thanks for that add-on, Chris in Toronto. Hey, Tom, did you know what today is? What it's the anniversary of? Uh, well, I was going to say today is the day we we finally added Pluto to our photo collection, but I didn't. What's the what's it the anniversary of? It's the anniversary of the Comcast call. Oh, the your Comcast call. <laughs> yes. Is it really like it was a year yeah. ago? Yeah, and I only know that because Cory Doctorow tweeted about it this morning. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, it is. Oh. My only my only sadness around that call is that we didn't get your side of the conversation recorded. Only Ryan's. I know, I know. It was a sad. It was probably for the best. I, I sounded kind of crazy, <laughs> and a little, little bit like I'm about to cry. But anyway, uh, so I thought it would be appropriate to read this email um, over here from John. He writes on the Comcast 2 gigabit service that uh, you guys mentioned yesterday on the show. He says I had to chuckle thinking about Comcast 2 gigabit service and the fact that unless you brought some, bought some specialized commercial grade networking equipment for your home, you probably wouldn't be able to get above one gigabit per second. Any consumer router or switch is going to max out at one gigabit per second, effectively having your $300 a month service, $300 a month service. Uh, then again, I doubt they can get above 20 megabit per second during peak hours. But a ching. Love the show. Keep it up. Your boss from Billings, Montana office. Hey, thanks, boss. I'm uh, sorry. Well, is that MT? MT is Montana, right? Yeah, I think that's Montana. Okay. Billings is definitely in Montana. It so. is, right? Yes. Uh, okay. Yeah. 20 megabit, you won't have a problem during peak hours because no one else can afford the service. <laughs> so that, well, yeah, Peter, Peter Rojas actually yesterday was, was tweeting about this because he was thinking of setting it up and he wanted to get on the horn with someone from Comcast and really talk to them about it. And they, he was on the phone for hours and nobody could answer his questions. And nobody really knew the answers to his questions. And they're like, we just haven't been briefed on this yet. Yeah. We don't know. Yeah, so they're not, I mean, you can't even talk to someone about this right now. It's too early, weird. yeah. Too early for that. Uh, well, it's starting in Boston, I think, is right. where they're rolling it out first. So maybe there's a customer service group in Boston that's been briefed. I don't, by now, I don't know. Uh, there is a five hundred dollar uh, installation charge and a five hundred dollar uh, installation fee. So there's like up, and it's up to that. Depends on the installation, but up to a thousand dollars just to get it installed. I'm gonna guess. I'm gonna be charitable to Comcast without knowing for sure that that includes a router that can deliver two gigabit per second speeds. That it, it would have to be for it to be that expensive, and it would make sense because they'd have to give you a commercial grade router. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that's really expensive. It's pretty expensive. Yeah. It's yeah. I mean, in San Francisco, we have Monkey Brains, which monthly is much cheaper, but the installation is far higher. Um, but you pay that off. Yeah, yeah, I think. I don't remember. I think, yes, mm -hmm. yes, yes. Um, <laughs> yes. 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 But it is nice that these things are, are starting to roll out and people are getting, I mean, this is, you know, it's definitely going to improve speeds for a lot of people, Comcast subscribers. But, yeah, you have to, you got to pay the money for it. Their market well, is the rich kids of Instagram, but, you know. There so you that's go. fine. Yeah. <laughs> they really need their Instagram videos to load mm -hmm. fast. Exactly. <laughs> Uh, thank you to John, Chris, and Nicholas for your emails. Uh, and thank you, Jessica Condit, for joining us. This was great. Thank you. Thanks so much for taking some time to chat with us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. This was awesome. Go find Jessica's work at Engadget.com, uh, and they can follow you on Twitter at Jess Condit. Is that right? That's correct, yeah. J-E-S-S-C-O-N-D. 
D I T T. Two T's at the end. Two Part T's. of the two T's at the end club, along mm -hmm. with myself. <laughs> Only one. Uh, anything uh, on the horizon to tell folks about? Um, yeah, so we're going to have a bunch of Gamescom coverage coming up. That's the big convention out in Germany. So please stay tuned to that. And tomorrow we're streaming Wind Waker as our uh, tribute to Iwata. So please tune Aww. into that as well. Yeah, Very nice. So you just go to find the link at Engadget.com for those? Yeah, we'll have a post and everything, and I'll be tweeting a storm about it. So don't worry about that. Excellent. Veronica Belmont, also on Engadget, hosts Ask Veronica, upon which nope. Jessica has been. No, dear Veronica. Dear Veronica, Veronica is what I said. Totally, that's what I said, dear Veronica. Because you wouldn't ask Veronica, you'd say, dear Veronica, and then you'd write her a question. You know, I almost named the show that, and then I didn't, and now I think maybe I should have named the show that, because that's everybody what everyone does calls that. it. I'm sorry yeah. about that. <laughs> <laughs> totally fair, but yeah, dear Veronica, new episodes every Wednesday at 9 a.m. Eastern Time. Nope, noon Eastern Time, 9 a.m. Pacific Time. Get those backwards sometimes. Uh, but yeah, we've got, I've got a couple of special guests coming up in the next couple episodes. I've got a certain Tom Merritt coming up next week. And I've got uh, Pat, Mr. Patrick Norton submitted an answer for, nice. for a question um, about uh, home automation. So that'll be the week after. So yeah, it's going gonna, it's, it's gonna to be a co-host-a-thon, former, former and current co-host-a-thon over on Dear Veronica, which is always fun. Excellent. Dear Veronica, as it is written down right in front of me right now on Engadget.com, <laughs> go check it out. Uh, thank you to our patrons, 5,058 of you are willing to back us on a regular basis on patreon.com and make the show possible and we literally couldn't do it without you. Uh, it allows us to have Jenny and Roger and Veronica and all of our contributors uh, putting together the show Monday through Friday every week. Uh, you guys are the best. Patreon.com slash Ace Detect if you would like to join them uh, or if you're feeling like becoming a co-executive producer and up in your pledge or if you just want to go to dailytechnewsshow.com slash support for all the different ways to support the show. If you're like, I can't commit on a regular basis but I'd like to help out maybe just once uh you can do that too one way is buy a dtns shirt uh we have regular dtns shirts with the logo on them they make great gifts or if you're going to nerdtacular in salt lake city at the end of this month you can get a special nerdtacular version it spells out nerdtacular on the back of the shirt with all of our names crosshatched in there uh, and you can get that at the store and have it shipped to nerdtacular for free when you use the code two sides that's at dailytechnewsshow.com slash store our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com and give us a call 51259 daily listen to the show live monday through friday at 4 30 p.m eastern and listen to it at alphageekradio.com visit our website at dailytechnewsshow.com we'll be back tomorrow with scott johnson talk to you then the show is part of the frog pants network get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs> Great show. Thank you, Jessica. That was awesome. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Yeah, that was really fun. That was cool. We're going to stick great. around and name the show along with the chat room, uh, but if you need to go, take off. I do. Whatever. I do. Uh, well, yeah. Thank you guys very much. It was, this was cool. I'd be glad to be back at any time. Yeah. So, Come yeah. back soon. Okay, cool. Bye. Bye. <laughs> What should we call it? A hacker, a fake date, a faker, updated map maker. Oh, that's so good. <laughs> well done, Dark Redeemer. If we go with that, that would be two in a row, I think, for him. Mm -hmm. Then there's also real, oh, it's also Dark Redeemer, exit it. As, it, as opposed to Exodus, exit it. Oh, uh, e -X -O, it. yeah, you kind of have to look at it. You have to look it. at it. Pretty yeah. genius. Which is good. It works for, for print. <laughs> mm -hmm. Apple Pay in the UK, the London way. <laughs> That's too long. Yeah, sure too really, long. Really enjoying internal rhyme scheme today. Don't make fun of my curmudgeoniness. That's too long. Stop making fun of my curmudgeoniness. Not oh, curmudgeoniness. Curmudgeoniness. <laughs> Everybody to the limit. Everybody to the limit. The beat is to the limit. Everybody come on, Bohoga Sod. Say, come on, Bohoga Sod. Say, come on, Bohoga Sod. Everybody come on, Bohoga The beat is to the limit. Everybody come on, Bohoga Sod. Wow, you know all the words. That's amazing. That's the only words, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't even know those. Uh, <sighs> My nose is so itchy. All right. Oh, what do you guys think for a title? Title, title, come on. Are we just like going to go? It. 
Oh, okay. So we have me. a little controversy. A hacker, a faker, updated Mac maker, or exited? Do we talk about hackers on the show? I don't remember that. Um, Flash. Oh. I guess. And who's a faker? I will say that in, in, in the act of brevity, I, I might go with exited. Oh, well. I will vote on it. There. Hmm. I think I like exit it. Exit it is, uh, is getting a uh, posse. Yeah. <laughs> so I think we might be going with exit it. Okay. Veronica, yeah, you haven't expressed your definitive opinion yet, though. I, I, I just don't care. <laughs> <laughs> I just want it to be over. I'm, just, I'm so tired. <laughs> Please let me go to sleep. I'm going to go see... Um, What's it called? Ant Man, soon. Oh, really? Oh, Rudd. Yeah, the uh, at Dolby. Is it a preview? It is. Nice. Is it a screener? Well, I'm that doesn't help cool us guy. any. Super cool guy, Veronica Belmont here. In <laughs> Ant Man early. Yeah, you have to pay to see it again later to help our draft, though. I'm not. I'm not involved with your draft. You should draft. have been. Well, you should stop doing it on gosh darn Tuesday nights. What were you, flamenco dancing? No, I have vaginal fantasy. Oh, never mind. That's a good excuse. <laughs> but that's when night attack is. Well, that's dumb. I don't know. Dumb. Talk to them. I'm going to put that on your headstone. But that's dumb? <laughs> no, it's, uh, but that's... But that, uh, that night is vaginal fantasy and it's just a thing quotes <laughs> that goes on her headstone I don't get that that would make sense that would just be true <laughs> and also too late to see her on the show at that point oh yeah but actually who was it I think it was my dad no it wasn't my dad was it my mom no it was my grandma had her name on the headstone even before she died because it was one of those yeah. dual headstones. And um, they, had, they had put her husband's name on one side and he had passed away. And then it had her name with her birth year and then a dash and then a space. Yeah, but how do they do that with the same precision? I get, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, they when, they, to... when they add in the year later, it's cheaper because they, they did it all the rest of it at once. But it's going to look a little different. You're right. Yeah, that's what, I don't know. I'm going to do what my parents did and just pre-buy plots. They, they're really expensive now. So I'm getting buried Veronica, underneath a tree. Yeah. Pre-existing tree? No, there's a thing in Italy that they're doing. I saw it in one of my many trolls of the internet where you, they put you in a pod, like an egg under a tree sapling, and then you grow. A pod. Oh, so you get creepy. cremated and then... So shut you're a you're, you're nope. tree fertilizer. Your tree fertilizer. You're feeding the tree. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. You you're like, like in a little, your body's in like a little pod. Right. Like an egg. You can look it up. And then it, and it makes the tree grow, maybe. I already told Tom what I wanted. Really painful if you're not actually dead. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> I would have my remains spread over a large open field of corn or whatever, or wheat. And then when the wheat grows, it would be cut down and made into a cake in order not to eat it. On the anniversary, <laughs> my passing. <laughs> I can't elaborate. wait. I hope I live long. I hope I outlive <laughs> you so I can eat your cake. <laughs> uh, right, I gotta go take care of the Doge. Okay, I forgot what I was gonna ask you anyway. So it's okay. Oh, is Vaginal Fantasy tonight? No. Why? Because tonight's Monday. It's the last Tuesday of every oh, it's the last Tuesday of every yeah. month. No, you're right. Last Tuesday. Last. Last Tuesday. Got it. Happy Did you Monday, know everyone. That Felicia Day and I have the same birthday, and Bonnie Burton and my wife have the same birthday. That's Thank half you. of your cast. Wow. Wowie, wow, wow. All right, go take the dog out. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Wowie, wow, wow, Tom. Bye. <laughs> cool story, bro. Cool story, Tom. You're into star signs and astrology. And somehow we're all connected because of our birthdays. Yeah, we're Wowie. all exactly the same. Wowie, wow, wow. So wow. 
Bye. 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 <laughs> <Sure. laughs> <sighs> you know, right? Her husband Ryan does that same wowy wow wow thing, and sometimes, some, for some reason, it hurts more when he does it. I don't know why. It's because he does it without the without the ribbing that you get. Because you <laughs> consider Veronica to be like a sister. He's just I like guess. He, yeah. his is more of a kind of a more more of a I don't know more <laughs> of a sneering wowy wow wow. There's a punch to it. Yeah, there's a bite to it. It's good. I respect it. <laughs> she she says the last thing she said in the chat room. Well, folks, I thought that was a successful show. It was a great show. Awesome. Yep. And you know I say that every time, but that's only because it's true. Well, yep. you could do it my way and just be super critical of it and not very enthusiastic until that one episode that like puts everyone on Mars. Then you're like, this was a good episode. That's, you're giving away your secret there. That's the whole point. If you make everything special, nothing's special. And so you must pour scorn and criticism. <laughs> it's what my parents have taught me through life. Uh, you got a 98. What happened to the other two? It's true. Why did you miss two? Yeah. Like, mm. how, <laughs> why did you miss two? Harsh. You know, my grandparents were like, or my grandpa particularly on my mom's side was like that. Actually, that's true. I've noticed that with, especially people who were born into the depression, mm -hmm. were, were, were less impressed, impressed, impressed with a lot of stuff. It's like, yeah. like you would really have to be like a barnstormer to, to really like, whoa, that's, that's really good. It's so true. Um, so, Roger, uh, would you help me out with the video today? Because I'm in a slow upload location. Yep. No worries. Thank you. Excellent. Oh, so I've been up since 6.30, and it really does feel like time for a cold brew coffee of some kind. Time for oh, a cold ooh. brew. Did you have to... Prepare for class? Is that what you so up? No, I did that late last night, and then I forgot I had a doctor's appointment at 8 a.m., which is, like, brutal. I hate those, especially yeah. when I schedule it. It's like, oh, I'll wake up. I'll make mm -hmm. it. Then you realize, oh. And then you forget to put your little reminder, like, a couple hours early, and you get 30 minutes, run out the door. Mm -hmm. Although, in this case, it's the dentist for me. It's like, ah, oh, damn it. But I made it. I did all the things, and now I'm drooping. And with and that, we, we are done. I'm coffee and a large ice cream tea. Now we're done. I am out of the post. Okay. Stay tuned for a rerun of Vaginal Fantasy. No, uh, <clears throat> Night Attack. Night Attack is coming up tonight. It's a real, honest-to-goodness attack on your night. Don't miss it on diamondclub.tv immediately following this parade of Nokia sentimentality.